Okay, welcome back for our afternoon session. Um, our first speaker this afternoon will be Dwayne Rush from the Penn State Office of the Physical Plant. And he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about uh, the, the building you see here, which we're currently calling West One, um, which will house the acoustics program as well as a lot of the CAV lab spaces um, moving forward. So he's gonna to talk to us about some of those spaces. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all had a good lunch. Um, I just have a, a brief presentation with a few slides uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the West One project, as Andrew mentioned. Um, the image you see on the screen is the south elevation or the, or the main entrance of the building. Um, just to give a, a quick update on, on the status of construction, uh, we started construction just about 15 months ago with a giant hole in the ground. Um, the structure is just about complete. In fact, our next milestone will be setting the last piece of steel and celebrating our topping out ceremony uh, two weeks from today on November 2nd. So that'll be a great milestone for the project. Uh, our, our substantial completion is currently scheduled for January of 24, with move-ins starting that following spring, and the building will be fully occupied and in use in August of 24 for fall semester. I do that right? Oh, maybe that. <laughs> All right, what am I doing wrong? That's what I'm hitting the middle one. Oh, there we go. All right, so the building is about 290,000 gross square feet. Uh, it's five stories for the most part with a full basement. And the plan you see here on the screen is the basement space. And the three areas that we'll talk about today uh, a little bit of the uh, flow through anechoic chamber, which is in the green, the static anechoic chamber, which is in the, the purple and blue, and then the cab lab, which is uh, to the west there in the yellow. Uh, like I said, these spaces are all located in the basement. The uh, floor to floor height in that basement is about 20 feet to make sure we can get all the uh, infrastructure in we need for these spaces. So we'll start with the, uh, the flow through anechoic chamber. Uh, overall, the lab, including the chamber, is about 1,800 square feet. About 790 of that is the, uh, the chamber itself. And it's got about, uh, I'll, I'll go to the elevation here in a second. But uh, so, does this have a pointer? No. Okay. So, on the left side of the screen um, is most of the, uh, the research space, uh, the control center. Uh, and that sort of thing are along the south side uh, as the image goes. Uh, the Inaco chamber is uh, completely uh, walls, floor, ceiling, have all the sound cones, and we'll have a false floor that will uh, be at the same elevation as the grade outside the space so that when you, you can walk in um, without having to step up or down. A uh, big improvement over what's existing in Hammond building currently. This is a cross section through the chamber. It gives you a good idea of what's happening there. So we've got the flow through ductwork. Uh, the fan will be on the right side of the, of the image. And the um, air, as you see it here, the air will flow in a counterclockwise direction coming out the large nozzle uh, into the chamber. That not, everything that you see there is being fabricated, constructed, and installed by our general contractor and, and mechanical trade contractor. Uh, except for the nozzle and then the research pieces itself. That will be uh, designed and fabricated by the group um, that's going to be using this space. The clear space, the elevation uh, height in here is about 12 feet clear. Um, and uh, that's why we had to, like I said, we had to make sure we kept uh, a very high ceiling space in this basement uh, to get all this equipment in. It's a very tight fit. Um, Sean, uh, I have Sean Hurley on the Zoom call with me. He's with Payette Architects out of Boston. Uh, he's one of the lead designers for the lab spaces. Uh, Sean, is there anything you want to add for the uh, flow through chamber? Okay, never mind. <laughs> uh, I thought he would be. Okay, let's give him a second here before we move on. And I will say that all three of these spaces. Hi, are... can you all hear me? Yep, we can now, Sean. Hopefully yeah. I can hear you guys. 
Can you hear us? We hear you, Sean. <laughs> I can see you moving, Dwayne. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Um, so I caught a little bit of that and then I lost the sound of Dwayne. But yeah, the, the interesting thing here was the, the coordination between what we were going to provide as the project and what the users would, would provide as, as the researchers. Um, the other interesting part of this was that the, we really kind of had to get into sort of the details of how these chambers worked. Um, typically we'll create a lab space and we're just creating sort of the working area where someone can, can go in and do their research. But in this aspect, we were really trying to create the research. Um, so working with the researchers on the, the type of duct work, um, you know, what the requirements were around the fans, what the requirements are within the room itself uh, so that they can perform their research and then making sure we're clear on where we're, we're designating those lines of what we provide uh, versus what the, what the users provide. Um, and we had to have a lot of early conversations too with the supplier of the chambers um, just to make sure, you know, we understood all the requirements for how they would get installed, uh, what the capabilities are, um, and then what recommendations they have. And we continue to work on that. As you can imagine, this is uh, a complex space. So we're reviewing those, uh, those shop drawings as they come in, and in particular talking about this one and, and where all these openings are located. Yeah, like Sean said, good point. Um, a lot of times, you know, the, the, the main desire when you're building a building is you do all that design work during the design phase. So when you bid it and start construction, you're not making changes. Uh, this chamber and the lab space is a, is a good example of that we're continuing to make changes, um, you know, hopefully not to the, the point where it's going to delay or, or cost more money to the project, but we want to make sure we get it right. So we continue to work with Mark Miller, and his group um, to fine tune this design to make sure that what we're providing will work for them at the end of the day. Okay, now we'll move on to the anechoics, uh, the static chamber for acoustics. Um, this, this space is roughly 1,410 square feet total counting the uh, work areas. Uh, about 370 square feet of that is the anechoic sound chamber itself and about 320 square feet is the reverb chamber, uh, which is shown plan north there. Uh, once again, the, uh, the chamber is being provided by a, a specialty consultant uh, contractor that uh, will fabricate this chamber. There is a uh, removable window section between the chamber and the reverb room uh, to assist with research. And uh, Sean, why don't you give a little bit of update on this one as well? You're good at this. <laughs> Yeah, um, so this one was interesting because this one, the, the, the complexity here in the other one saw the duct work and I feel like that was uh, sort of the added complexity that we had there, you know, in addition to the chamber. This one, again, we have the chamber, but the, the added, the added um, sort of uh, difficulty here was with the reverb room and working with the users on what that would mean. Um, and, and early on finding out that, you know, you can have any sides that are, are sort of parallel to each other you know, what the surfaces of the walls are inside of that room. Um, we had a lot of conversations too on, on sort of life safety and, and, you know, providing air into that reverb room, which ultimately ended up where, you know, the door would always stay open. Um, so there was a lot of interesting parts and we, ended, we had to bring in a lot of different people. Um, we had a, an acoustical consultant who also helped us with this. We had the help of the, the researcher. We had the help of the chamber supplier. We had the architect. We had the contractors looking at it. Um, and, and then you know, just between all of us sort of working closely together, we were able to come to a size and a design that, that ended up working. Yeah, let me change the image here to, uh, so this is an isometric cut through the Anico chamber, which is on the left side and the reverb room on the right. Uh, like Sean said, we had to make sure we got the angles right, um, building this reverb room, the, uh, the type of construction with uh, concrete masonry units, uh, they'll be solid filled with, with flowable concrete. Um, it's uh, like, like Sean said, there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts and it's uh, definitely a learning curve for, for me. I've done uh, numerous projects at Penn State, but they're mostly uh, wet labs, chemistry labs, that sort of thing. Um, and the, the spaces that are in this new West One building are uh, very unique 
Um, they're, as we like, we, we refer to them a lot of one-offs, right? So they're, there are a lot of specialty spaces, uh, no other room in the building is like it, and probably no other room on campus is like it. So we're, we're definitely all learning as we go from the design team all the way down through the construction team and the contractors doing the work. Yeah, the other thing here to join while you have this up is um, we figured out very early on after visiting the existing Anaco chambers on campus that if we could, we wanted to try to figure out a way to provide a floor within the chamber. Um, so you can see in this diagram where the axon is inside the chamber, and apologies, the chamber isn't you know exactly correct with the wedges, um, but we dropped down the floor where the chamber is. So the wedges would be below the floor, and then we could come in with a metal grate flooring system that would be actually at the level of the floor. So you would go straight from the floor, you know, within your lab space, open up the chamber door, and then you would be level with the walkable surface that's inside the chamber. Um, I think when we saw the existing echo chambers, you would have to pull out all the wedges in order to walk around and set stuff up. Um, so we wanted to, to provide them with something where they, where they didn't have to do that in the future. Um, and hopefully make their lives easier when they're when they're setting up experiments. Right, and for both of those spaces, um, because we did do a recessed lab in the basement, obviously that's very early on during the construction. So we had to make sure we had that pit uh, located properly and sized properly um, before we poured it, so that we wouldn't have to do rework there. So we had to uh, we had to jump through a few hoops last minute before those slabs were poured, but uh, we believe we got it correct. And then last but not least is the CAD lab itself. Um, this is uh, compared to the anechoic chambers, a little bit simpler space. Um, like all three spaces that we're talking about, they're all replicating uh, spaces that exist in Hammond building um, in the basement. But uh, it is our hope that we've made some vast improvements uh, over those existing spaces that were kind of forced into, into rooms that were available in Hammond at the time. Um, so Sean, I didn't bring any elevation, Sean, but if you can just give a quick uh, rundown on the, on the specific features of this space. Sure. Um, this space is a little bit less com complicated than some of the other ones we were looking at. Uh, basically just provide a, a large open space for them. Uh, we did provide sort of a vestibule at the entry to help with any sound um, from escaping the room and sound going into the room. Uh, Isolation table in the middle of the space. We had to do some special stuff around the slab to provide that. Uh, there's a wall of, of benches over there on the left hand side, uh, working tables. Uh, there's one sink within the space. We've, we've sort of moved that off to the side to give them that space just in the middle as, as flexible. Um, and then there's a few things just at the back of the room that the users requested that's, that's their equipment. One is a, a structural cantilever. Um, that can then get attached directly to the concrete foundation walls. Um, so that'll be as strong as they need it to be. And then the prefabricated acoustical chamber, um, which I think is actually maybe an existing piece of equipment, or they're going to buy a new piece of equipment that they can bring in there and, and set that up, you know, when they're ready for it. Um, but just trying to provide basically a, a big flexible space that they can, they can use depending on um, the research that they're working on at that time. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, so really, that's about all I had to share and show. Uh, we just wanted to, to give a quick rundown on the spaces, where they're located in the building, and a quick time frame of, of when we expect to be up and running. Um, so I know we have some time for questions, so I'll throw it open to questions. <laughs> so we do have um, several members of our biomedical acoustics group uh, that will be having labs on the third floor uh, jointly with aerospace. I was wondering if you talk a little bit about some of the features of the wet labs uh, that are going in the new building. Yeah, I'll let you talk to that, Sean. You could. Sure. Um, so we don't have any drawings of that, but the wet labs, yes. sorry, did someone say something? Oh yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. Um, yeah, up on the third floor, what we've done with all the, the wet labs up on the upper floor is we try to have a, a similar setup, um, to allow for flexibility. So there's, 
what we've been calling collaboration spine where, where students can sort of gather uh, some soft seating spaces, uh, you know, conference room, some monitors. Then from there, you go into, a you go into the uh, computational area, desks, computers, um, that sort of area for the, for the researchers. Then we have their open wet lab. Um, so benches, uh, extremely flexible, gases going to all the benches, um, compressed air, vacuum, nitrogen. Um, we work closely with the researchers on different equipment that would get put in those areas, sinks, fume hoods. Um, I think there's actually a very particular fume hood that's going in there that's like eight feet long and, and has a cup sink. Um, and then from there, we go into the support rooms. And the support rooms are where we really get into to some of the more unique attributes that, that are going on here. Um, so they had uh, some testing equipment that had liquid nitrogen. So that ends up in one of those support rooms and we have monitors to, to monitor that in sort of a safe way. Um, and there was some additional equipment that, that also went in there. I remember working closely with Mika on, on how some of the piping worked for her equipment and trying to draw that on the wall and diagram all of that. Um, again, it was a, it's a piece of equipment that some of the stuff is going to be user provided, but we just want to make sure we track through so we're providing the, the, the correct power where we need it and the correct gases where we need it. Um, but in working with them, I, I think we've been able to accomplish that. All right. Thanks, Sean. Any other questions? All right. If not, thank you very much. Okay. I do actually apologize. Now that I'm thinking about it, I was just talking about aerospace and not the acoustics part of that. The acoustics part is actually up to the north, and I was talking to the south part uh, with aerospace. For the acoustics area, same thing with the with the open lab, providing some fume hoods. Um, I have to check if we have biosafety cabinets up there, but extremely flexible. And then we have the two support rooms that that um, Julie wanted. Um, in particular, one of them had you know, some specialty sinks. She wanted a marine edge based on what she was working on. We've provided um, sort of the support room where it can get blacked out to a certain degree because um, some of the research she was doing needed that sort of environment. Um, we've talked about some specialty tables. I think these are gonna be two of the strongest tables that we have in the entire project um, based on the requirements that she had for what those tables needed, support, needed to support. Um, and then there's an additional uh, support room to the south of that, which I think was tissue culture, but again, I'm going off of memory. Um, so I do apologize if I, if I got the name of that wrong. Um, but that's sort of how the, the open labs are set up. A, a very flexible space that's, like was mentioned, shared in the open lab between aerospace and acoustics. And then there are more dedicated support rooms off of that. Um, one, two of them are for acoustics um, that are to the north and we placed them to the north. So I think it has a door going off to the corridor, because I think that was one of the requests is that they could wheel their equipment from the corridor directly into the, the support room. All right, thanks, Sean, appreciate your help. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, Dwayne and Sean. That was great. I know one of the things I'm really excited about in the new building is is the um, you know flexible conferencing and collaboration spaces as well. So um, I don't know where this conference will be in two years, but I um, mean there's a possibility we may do some of this over in that new building. So um, hopefully we'll be able to to bring you into there not next year but the year after. So thank you. Okay, our next speaker um, is Dr. Murad Ozic. Um, Dr. Ozic is a new research faculty member in the graduate program for acoustics. And he just recently took over the acoustic materials and metamaterials CAV group. So he's gonna give us an overview of uh, what's going on in that group. The middle one, so I need. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna try my best to um, present what's going on with these groups, actually. So um, 
It's been recently that I've been promoted to the assistant research professor, professor in like three months now. Um, so this group is about uh, acoustic metamaterials and acoustic materials in general. And research area uh, in general are about material characterization, manufacturing techniques for novel materials, acoustic cloth, kin, inverse design for metamaterials and also active metamaterials and structural vibration control through novel materials. Uh, this is the list of uh, faculty members and also students that uh, I'm in the process of actually uh, updating the students uh, list. So today I'm gonna give you examples of projects conducted under this uh, technical group. So first, the first project will be about uh, the use of uh, topology optimization to design uh, meta surfaces for wave uh, for wave propagation and specifically for elastic wave propagation and this project is conducted by uh, 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 Cliff Mary and Parisa um, and uh, actually the basic idea is uh, to design uh, resonators uh, just try to yeah resonators uh, in a way to stop or create um, band gaps for uh, either flexural modes or surface acoustic modes um, uh, in a, an optimized way to target specific frequency. So basically, basically we have a targeted frequency and we know that the anti-resonance phenomena is responsible for the creation of the band gaps. Uh, when we consider a lattice of these resonators on the top of a surface or, or on top of, or, of a plate. So if, like we said, I said, like we, we want, we have a frequency, we have a design, we start from a, a design and we use topology optimization to uh, end up with the uh, complicated shape of resonator uh, at this, uh, that can resonate at this specific frequency. So basically the meta surface, we call it meta surface because we use just uh, a number, a finite number of flyers of resonators. Uh, so this is called also locally resonant meta surface. If we use this, for example, three rows of these resonators uh, at, spe at the specific free resonant, anti-resonance frequency, we can have uh, a dip in transmission uh, caused by this reason. So we have total reflection of the wave and the uh, low transmission. And here uh, we have the um, wave transmission. So in blue, you have the incident uh, and the reflected wave uh, at, the, at the left region. And you can see the, for example, in, in this case, we have a plate. So what we call lamp modes. So we have the anti-symmetric lamp modes, A0, uh, zeroth order, and zeroth order uh, symmetric uh, plate modes. So they, they are completely cancelled, I mean, reflected, uh, in, and we don't see uh, these modes uh, E0 and uh, um, yeah, E0, which is a red curve actually. And uh, the S0, which is the symmetric mode of the plate, is uh, um, highly uh, reduced. Yeah. Uh, this also, this. Um, use of anti-resonance phenomena is also uh, leveraged for uh, surface acoustic waves because the place of surface acoustic waves is very important uh, for uh, many kind of application at low frequency we talk about uh, uh, seismic waves uh, and we have at a little bit higher frequency traffic loading uh, and at high frequency we have so devices and so sensors that can operate from one megahertz to uh, one gigahertz and even for higher one gigahertz, these kind of systems are, um, we have also optimechanical applications. Um, so it is important to control these surface waves. So several uh, basic design, design were proposed for these resonators to, uh, to, to either filter the waves, I mean, reflect the waves or, or even enhance their transmission. Um, but also we can also, use topology optimization. We know that if we plot the transmission, we know that the band gap is created that, but the resonance frequency, we have FA is the targeted frequency and topology optimization can also use, can be used to have complicated shape 
of resonators that can be used um, to completely re uh, reflect the wave. And uh, we have here kind of a metamaterial barrier for these waves. Uh, a third uh, example is also uh, controlling surface acoustic wave for seismic application, seismic wave application in granular media. Uh, this, if you were at the poster presentation yesterday, you would have, I mean, um, uh, seen in this project actually. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna like probably, this is the motivation behind this work is to uh, uh, protect building from system, seismic waves. The, the, the motivation here is that most of the previous work that uh, designed metamaterials or meta barriers for uh, shielding uh, uh, for seismic waves considered that the soil are homogeneous media, but actually in reality, uh, soil has uh, the wave velocity changing with the depth because of compression. So we have to consider this when studying the dispersion of surface acoustic waves. So these surface acoustic waves uh, become dispersive when we have different kinds. And uh, we, can, we can actually, we have to take this into account in, when designing these uh, metamaterial barrier. So here you have these uh, rods embedded partially into the soil and simulation uh, taken into account the properties of the soil uh, were conducted to find the best uh, configuration uh, to use actually to combine the coupling between the resonance modes of the these uh, rods, embedded rods, and the dispersive surface acoustic wave to be able to stop them, uh, for, uh, stop them and reflect them or add in or deviate them to the bulk. It, yeah, so this is an example of 400 Hertz, uh, but this can be also scaled up to target very low frequencies, uh, the frequencies of seismic waves. So the fourth project I want to talk about is uh, uh, something we are working on for several years now. It's about the design of architected lattices for also suppress, to suppress vibrations. And the objective is to have lattices that are lightweight and can also can be mechanically strong, sufficiently strong, and can shield uh, uh, vibrations at the low frequency. So this is an example of uh, an oxytic lattice, 3D oxytic lattice that was uh, designed and fabricated. And if you calculate the band dispersion, the, or what we call the band structure of this lattice, uh, we have a different direction of propagation. We have a re frequency region, which are like um, gray regions, which are band gaps where no mode can propagate inside the structure. We conducted actually, we 3D printed these lattices using a, a, a technique that was developed by uh, our collaborator in UCLA, Professor Zhang. And uh, so we have here a good agreement between simulation and experiments. Another kind of lattice we studied is we 3D printed this uh, active metamaterial, which is which uh, made by the magnetic material. And using actually a an external magnetic field, we can uh, we designed this structure to have buckling effect so that when we change the magnetic field, uh, it buckles. So we have different states here from shape one to shape five, depending on when we increase actually the magnetic field. And we study the wave propagation through this structure, uh, a different configuration, which is shown at the right here. So we can either control, so we have a tunable transmission. You can have either state like shape five where you have high transmission, or shape one will have very low transmission. So you control, you, we can control uh, the wave uh, propagation through uh, this uh, 1D lattice. And we can also control the resonance of frequency of this, of this lattice, uh, active lattice. Uh, another example is what we call octet truss structure. Uh, octet truss, we use it because it's kind of uh, stiffer than the previous one I showed you. So we, want, we are targeting like high uh, mechanically uh, uh, strong structures, which can shield vibration. So for example, to the left, if you take an octet truss with relatively thick rods, uh, you cannot, uh, vibration still uh, propagate through the structure, but uh, we, you can have, you have high effective stiffness. 
However, if you use thin rods, uh, although you can have uh, the vibration can be attenuated at, at higher frequencies, but uh, this, the structure can be like uh, very uh, not, not strong enough. However, we can use hybrid design combining thin and thick rods uh, for this octet truss lattice to uh, increase the stiffness, the effective stiffness of the lattice, and at the same time have a low transmission of the wave through, uh, through the structure. Um, another direction we explore is uh, about the wave physics. Uh, this time is we try to uh, mimic um, condenser matter physics phenomena to discover new ways for controlling acoustic waves. So an example is what we call here the creation of defects, with lattices with defects called disclination. And this, these disclination can uh, can host uh, topological protected modes inside the lattice. Protected means that if we introduce another defect around, uh, the mode confined within the disclination is still uh, is still uh, robust. So, um, for example, these these are actually this is the motivation behind this because um, from the since the appearance of topological insulator, we witnessed the emergence of a topological. Uh, acoustic lattices where uh, using two lattices with different uh, band topologies, we can have the creation of an eight, what we call an acoustic edge state, which is a mode actually propagating at the interface between the two lattices. And this mode is created by the different topologies of the two lattices. So if you introduce a defect, you remove a unit cell or you bend your, uh, you have sharp bending of your wave guide the wave is still confined and propagates without any scattering. Uh, there, are, there, there has been also a demonstration of what they, they call topological corner modes, which are lattices that have uh, confined acoustic uh, modes at the corners, and also topological vortex states where you have like a defect and inside you have a, a mode confined. So what is a disclination? Basically you take a lattice, uh, like a hexagonal lattice, which has a C6 symmetry, and you cut uh, uh, like a slice and you just deform the lattice and um, uh, glue these, these, uh, uh, the, the lines of the cuts together and you create a defect. So you can go from C6 to C5 or you can create another kind of disclination by going from C6 to C4 symmetry. Um, how to do how to construct our lattice? Actually, we uh, consider two Helmholtz resonators or two cavities, acoustic cavities, uh, with coupling. So you can you can consider these as two atoms with states. Uh, so states uh, equivalent to the acoustic modes, and you have uh, a channel between connecting these two uh, uh, two tubes, and this channel is uh, will introduce the coupling between these two states. And by curving this channel, we can like make these two resonators like close together or uh, far apart at a certain limit. And we can actually design our structure and then we can uh, like, for example, on the left, you have the initial uh, hexagonal lattice and the unit cell, which is in the bottom left, uh, uh, where you, you can have internal coupling within inside the unit cell and internal coupling outside the, the unit cell, the internal coupling is coupling between the unit cells. So if you created this condenation, you can have two configuration. Either the internal coupling is higher than the external coupling or the external coupling is higher than the internal coupling. And uh, we control the coupling actually by positioning this, uh, this uh, uh, coupling uh, along on the top or the bottom. Um, so we call the left one where the internal coupling is higher, the topological non-trivial phase. So it's like a phase of matter. And the, to and the right one, the other uh, configuration topological trivial phase. Um, so in the case of non-trivial phase corresponding to coupling, uh, internal coupling smaller than external coupling, uh, we calculate the dispersion. We can find that the existence of corner modes, so modes with uh, pressure uh, concentrated mainly at the corners of the lattice. However, if we uh, create a, 
if we have a coupling, internal coupling higher than the external coupling, we can have modes at in, inside the discalination, so confined modes, so two modes with um, inverse, I mean, inverse symmetry, so rotated one rotated with respect to the other, so degenerate modes. And these modes are protected by the symmetry of the lattice. Uh, so experiments were, were carried out carried out here um, a while ago and paper were published in this year in PRL and uh, where we demonstrate we observe this actually discoloration mode um, here. Another uh, final project I want to introduce you is the also in this perspective of mimicking condensed matter physics phenomena is what we call topological pumping actually. Topological pumping of the wave for surface acoustic waves in, in our case. So this is an ongoing project. Actually, basically what is pumping is, for example, if you consider a city connected atoms, these atoms, you can consider them like uh, optical waveguides, coupled couple optical waveguide or acoustic waveguides. And imagine that uh, these atoms are complete, uh, actually, you know, unit cell, two atoms are different. They have a different potential. So if you have a state uh, in one atom, we can, with time, make the atom have the same uh, potential and we play with the coupling, we change the coupling in, in phase two here, and the state will be spread into the two atoms. Then we can uh, also go back in a situation where the second atom has a, a potential higher than the first atom, then the state will be confined within the second atom in the unit cell. We can repeat the process till we have our state going from the first unit cell to the uh, next unit cell. So this is what we call actually pumping of, of a state. So we try to do this um, for surface acoustic wave actually because this process in condensed matter physics was done in time by changing the potential and the coupling in time. But we can use the, the second dimension because this is 1D. We can use the second dimension as time. So we consider a, an acoustic waveguide or elastic waveguide. Basically, it can be a, a silicon. Silicon can be a, also the, the importance or the existence of this guided mode is that the shear velocity of, of the bulk uh, waves in the, for the waveguide has to be smaller than the shear uh, wave velocity of the substrate chosen. So we can have different configuration of materials that we can use. And basically we try dif uh, different piezoelectric material to move forward through the experiment because we need to do experiment. Uh, so this is how the mode look like, lo looks like. And uh, if we take two wave guides, they can couple together uh, as when you excite the mode at one wave guide, we see that the mode is modulated in space and we can calculate this, we can characterize the coupling by evaluating this modulation, the, the, the wavelength of the modulation as function of the distance between the waveguides. And we see that we have, so gamma here is the, uh, the, the coupling coefficient as function of the distance. And this, this is uh, quite um, similar to what was observed for coupled optical waveguides. Um, so we can actually describe, if we take a series of a couple of wave guides, we can actually describe their behavior by the Hamiltonian, like in condensed matter physics, and uh, where you have a state phi n, I mean a mode propagating uh, phi n uh, that can couple with the and with the other adjacent uh, next nearest uh, wave guides, and we can control the coupling between these wave guides. Uh, by changing the distances between them. So basically, for example, if I took this example, uh, if you see the, the phi here, uh, a constant phi will give you uh, a quasi-periodic distribution of these 15 wave guides in this example. So we can calculate actually the agent values of this Hamiltonian, which gives us the, the plot you have top left. So, phi, so for a fixed phi, we can have a configuration and we see that we have a band gap and we have a state inside the band gap. And this state is actually its topological edge state, which means that it's, if you excite your wave, uh, the wave guide to the right, the wave will go through all the wave guides. If you excite the middle, it, 
it's the energy is spread all over the waveguides. But if you if you excite to the left, uh, the energy, I mean, the wave is only confined within the two first waveguides and does not spread or spread weakly to the other waveguides. So we have here an edge state uh, for this lattice. Uh, then uh, we can actually uh, play with the coupling between the cup waveguide by going from one configuration phi one to phi two. So by wiggling these waveguides, we can actually transfer this uh, edge state from the left to the right or from the right to the left. Uh, and this process has to be done slowly uh, to, uh, to, you know, to, to be able to observe it. So this kind of, we transfer one state from two waveguides to the other waveguides uh, in a adiabatic ma manner. Yeah. So this is an overview actually about what we are doing. And uh, I thank you for um, for listening to me. And if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate. Yeah. Okay, next up we have our um International liaison, Felix Langfeld from uh, ISVR. And he's gonna uh, talk to us about research and noise control using passive and acoustic metamaterials going on at ISVR. So excited to have you here. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me actually. I'm really, really happy to be here and I really enjoyed this workshop. It was a great organization, very interesting topic. And uh, once again, I'm astonished how um, diverse acoustical research is actually. So we've seen every kind of thing. So I have the burden to give you the last technical talk today. So I try to make it very interesting. <laughs> but I will start off with some facts about ISVR just to give you an impression. Um, yeah, what the Institute of Sound and Vibration is, what we're doing. And then I'm going to talk about metamaterials and the stuff we do in terms of noise control using passive and like acoustic, active acoustic metamaterials. Yeah, so starting with the ISVR. So the ISVR is part of the University of Southampton in the UK. And I think like every university, we're structured in different faculties and departments and schools. So we have the five faculties at the University of Southampton, and we are part of the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences. And this faculty is divided into certain schools. Uh, we've got physics, school of physics, school of chemistry, school of electronics and computer science, and school of engineering. And the ISVR obviously is part of the school of engineering. And this is divided into four departments. We have got aero and astro, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and then ISVR. And um, it's important to know that, I mean, this is the structure, but uh, especially at ISVR, we are very keen in collaborating across these uh, departmental structure. So we have lots of um, collaboration in our school. So with Aero, for example, which is kind of a natural combination, acoustics and Aero, but also with civil engineering, mechanical engineering, and also other parts of the university. So what are we doing? I've got a work cloud here. So we've already saw a work cloud today. Um, the work cloud on the right, it's hard to read and you're not supposed to read it. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make with this word cloud is that we are doing a lot of different topics and this is based on 2000 publications from ISVR. And if you look more closely at it, you can, but I can tell you some keywords. We've got things like sound transmission. We've got things like cochlea, implants, um, absorption, ultrasound and trains. So, so many different topics. But what you can see, the, all these topics are clustered very closely together, which is to emphasize that we are doing research that covers lots of topics, but we work very closely together. 
And our mission statement, this is uh, written on the left here, is that we are committed to improving our understanding of acoustics and vibration, their impact on the well being of the community, and the quality and performance of engineering products. So, this is our mission statement. And um, so, if we look now at ISVR itself, so how do we organize our research? We've got three major research groups at ISVR we've got the Dynamics Group, the Acoustics Group, and the Signal Processing Audio and Hearing Group. So, these are the three um, research groups that are there. And we have also got a few consultancies associated with each of these groups or directly with ISVR. For example, the Dynamics Group has the Human Factors Research Unit. Um, the Acoustics Group has the Rolls-Royce UTC University Technology Center. So this is like a company um, funded um, part of, of a group. And then we've got in the Signal Processing Audio and Hearing Group, we've got the Hearing and Balance Center, including an audiology clinic. And finally, I want to mention the ISVR consulting unit, which is like a consultancy spin-off of um, the ISVR itself. So let's take a look at the different groups, starting with the dynamics group. So we've got the dynamics group. You can see the academics here. It's, this is just the permanent faculty stuff of, of the group. There are obviously more people involved in this group. There are PhD students, postdocs, other researchers, and of course, our students. And the dynamics group is dealing with vibrations and, of course, the noise that is associated with vibration. They are concerned with the prediction, control, and use of vibration, and they look into modeling and experimentation um, and of these kind of things. Then we have the acoustics group. I promise you these people actually have faces, but they didn't provide me any pictures, so here's just the list of the names. I put some pictures of their research instead at the bottom of the slide. So you can see the acoustics group also does a lot of different things. So we, for example, with rotor noise, we saw some talks today about this, um, or general error acoustical noise, ultrasonics, underwater applications, and also audio systems, for example, in cars to generate personal listening spaces. Last but not least, we've got the Signal Processing Audio and Human Group, or SPA, uh, which I'm a part of. So um, you can see my face uh, amongst those faces here. And SPA basically has four major research directions that are followed there. We've got the signal processing stream. We've got a stream that's going in the direction of audio. And we've got another stream that is focused on hearing and audiology. So like how a human perceives sound and how this is processed in, in the brain, for example. And then at the top, we have the uh, control part, which is uh, dealing with the control of sound, either passively or actively. And I guess you can see some familiar names. And at this point, maybe I want to mention that Steve Elliott, you can see him there, some may know him. He retired uh, in September. And right now we're looking for a new member of staff, member, member of faculty. So we're recruiting a lecturer or associate professor. So if you know someone or in, are interested yourself in joining the UK, the ICVR, then yeah, let me know and I can send you the details. Okay, so yeah, this is the basic overview of um, of uh, the ISVR. I hope it gives you a good impression. And now I will dig into some details about um, yeah my research in terms of um, acoustic metamaterials and how we can use them to do some noise control. Before I dig into the details, I joined the ISVR in March this year as a lecturer. And before that, I worked. Uh, in Hamburg, Germany, at the Hamburg University of Applied Sciences. You can see the logo in the top right. So some of this research is still associated with my former institution, but I'm still continuing this work as we all do. There are always open questions. So um, yeah, so this is basically what I'm doing right now at ISVR as well. So I want to look at different kinds of metamaterials that could be useful for noise control applications. I will highlight some interesting stuff about them, but also some challenges. And I will start with a metamaterial that is called a play-type acoustic metamaterial, or PAM. And a play-type acoustic metamaterial um, looks like this uh, in these two um, photos. Um, it's basically a thin film or a thin plate with periodically attached uh, masses, so like little discs, something that are arranged in a regular pattern. And if you look at the transmission loss, so basically this is a measure of how much sound insulation we have. So a higher transmission loss means a better sound insulation. And we can see on the right, the blue curve is basically the transmission loss of such a metamaterial, whereas the gray curve shows the mass law, which is a, the transmission loss of a plate that is homogeneous and has the same mass. 
And you can see at low frequencies, we have this nice little peak um, where the transmission loss is much higher than the mass loss. This is actually what makes these kind of um, metamaterials quite interesting for noise control applications because uh, in noise control, typically you say, well, either you have something that is very low in weight or you have something that has very high transmission loss at low frequencies. But this material has the opportunity to having both um, things at the same time, which is kind of interesting. How does this happen? What actually makes this kind of pen a mirror material? We can characterize the behavior of this mirror material uh, using a so-called effective mass. So if you look here over frequency at the effective mass of the structure, we can see that at very low frequency, the effective mass is basically the same as the static mass, which makes sense. We, we, we would think at zero hertz, this would have the same mass as the one we would measure using a scale or something. But if you increase the frequency, we can see that the, the effective mass becomes very dispersive, so changes with frequencies, and there are even frequency ranges where this effective mass actually becomes negative. So this is basically the idea behind a metamaterial that you look at it in terms of effective material properties, and you can see quite interesting stuff like negative density, for example. Where does this come from? So if we look at the vibration of this um, metamaterial at the antiresonance frequency here, which is highlighted in green in the plot on the top right, um, you can see the vibration looks like this. So this is one unit size. So we have the base plate and the mass in the middle. And if you look at the behavior of the vibration, it, the central part of the metamaterial vibrates out of phase of the surrounding part. So if we would average the displacement of this um, metamaterial across one unit cell, we would get a value of almost zero. And we can define uh, the effective mass of this metamaterial in a way that is very analogous to Newton's second law. So pressure equals effective surface mass density in this case, times the average acceleration. And if we solve this equation for the effective mass, you can see this surface average acceleration is in the denominator. And if this is zero, then we get a very high effective mass and a high effective mass means high sound transmission loss. So we can use this um, effective material property and plug this in into the well-known equation for the mass law to predict the transmission loss. And this is basically what is done here with the curve. The blue curve is a prediction based on this transmission loss formula using the effective mass and it matches the experiment quite well. So um, one thing I've, I've looked at in the past was um, making these metamaterials very lightweight and combining them with um, insulation blankets that you can find, for example, in an aircraft cabin, which is usually used to um, thermally insulate the fuselage from the cabin. And the interesting thing about these panels, is you can make them very thin and very flexible, so it's quite easy to integrate them into these uh, insulation blankets. So you can here see a picture of the test sample that was uh, manufactured for this kind of research. And here's also an illustration how it would look like in the aircraft side wall. So you can see the fusage on the left with these stringers, with these stiffness, then some insulation blankets with embedded PAM, and then the big black line is the lining of the cabin that we can see when we sit inside the aircraft. And in the right schematic, it's shown how this um, experimental setup was uh, looking like, so it was like a simplification of fusage. So we had an MDF plate, a glass wool layer, and then the metamaterial on top of it. And what's important to notice that the metamaterial was quite lightweight. It was, it was just 500 grams per square meter. And in terms of overall mass, this metamaterial just added about 13.5% of mass. So it's not a whole lot. And if you look at the transmission loss that was measured under diffuse incidence in the lab, uh, in the, in the lab you can see the gray curve, which is basically our wall with glass wool, but without metamaterial. And then the blue curve is what hap what's happening if we add this metamaterial to this setup. And you can see quite an astonishing um, improvement of the transmission loss of around 10 decibels um, at the under-resonance frequency of the metamaterial, which is much higher than what we expect by just you know, adding 30.5% of mass to our structure. Um, it's also important to note, and this is actually a quite interesting effect, is that if we combine this metamaterial with the glass wool, which is a poroelastic material, this will interact and these poroelastic material will act like an added stiffness and also added damping, which will change the unreasonable frequency of the metamaterial, 
You can see this in the plot here where the peak shifts to slightly higher frequencies when we combine it with the glass wool. Okay, so this is the first kind of metamaterial I wanted to talk about. The second type of metamaterial is actually a thing that's been known for centuries, I guess, which is called a Helmholtz resonator. So I guess we've all seen or heard one. And, and there's also one way to look at Helmholtz resonators uh, with a metamaterials kind of view. And to explain this, I want to give you this example here where we have a air volume with an Helmholtz resonator inside. And we have a piston that can be used like an, you know, like an air pump that you know from cycling or something um, that we can use to compress this air volume. So the piston will change the volume of our air. And in these animations, we can see what's actually happening with the pressure inside this air, air volume if, if we move the piston. And there, I, I don't know if you can see it, but there are tiny little orange arrow, arrows that indicate the, you know, the force that is felt on the piston when you move the piston um, along this um, volume. So if we don't have any Helmholtz resonator in this volume, it makes sense if we push in the piston, we will feel a force that is working against uh, the movement of the piston, which is just the pressure increasing inside the volume. Now if we put in the Helmholtz resonator and look at frequencies that are much lower than the resonance frequency of the Helmholtz resonator, the behavior is not different. So again, if we push in the piston, pressure will work against the movement of the piston. But if we now look at frequencies that are just slightly higher than the resonance frequency of our Helmholtz resonator, the Helmholtz resonator will start to move out of phase compared to the volume that is surrounding the Helmholtz resonator. You can see it in the colors when the Helmholtz resonator has a high pressure indicated by the red, and then the surrounding volume will have low pressure. And if we look now at the arrows on the piston, we've got some strange behavior. Suddenly, if we move in the piston, the force is pointing inside the volume. So it tries to pull the piston further in, even though we are pushing in the piston. And this can be characterized by something that is called a negative bulk modulus. So suddenly the stiffness of our air volume at some frequencies is negative. And you can show this also using experiments. So here you can see a this is a Helmholtz resonator in a impedance tube. It's actually a Christmas ball, so it's almost the correct season to show this picture. Um, but you can see on the plot on the right, the blue curve is basically the effective bulk modulus of this Helmholtz resonator in the tube. And you can see how it changes over frequency. Some frequencies becomes very low. In this case, it, the bulk modulus doesn't become negative, but it becomes almost zero, which indicates that the stiffness of the air volume with the Helmholtz resonator um, becomes very, very low. So it's like the, the, the air layer is actually much bigger than it's, it is in reality. And we can also use an equation to characterize this. Um, I've put the equation here, which is just a yeah, typical Helmholtz resonator based equation. So how can we use this um, behavior of the Helmholtz resonator when it's inside an air volume? And one thing we looked at is uh, by looking at a standard double wall where we have two walls that are separated by an air gap. And one big problem in these double walls, so the classical problem in noise control is that these masses and the air gap in between, they form a mass spring mass system as indicated in the lower right. And this has a resonance, which is called a mass air mass resonance frequency. And this mass air mass resonance frequency, typically you want it to be as low as possible because at the mass air mass resonance frequency, the transmission loss is really, really low. So not much sound insulation. Um, the problem is, however, to move this mass and mass resonance frequency to very low frequencies, you need either very heavy walls or a very large gap between the walls. And that's, these are usually things that you don't really want in most applications. So the, the idea here was to put in a Helmholtz resonator in between these two walls to change the stiffness of the air gap. And we can see in this picture here, that, which is a simulation, that this indeed works. So the black dashed curve is the double wall without a Helmholtz resonator. And the blue curve now shows the behavior of the double wall when we include a Helmholtz resonator. The mass of the walls and also the spacing of the walls hasn't changed at all. But we can see in the red circled area that the mass and mass resonance frequency is slightly lowered. And additionally, at the resonance frequency of the Helmholtz resonator, which is FR, we get a high peak. 
So we, we get a very broad improvement of the transmission loss at lower frequency just by inserting this Helmholtz resonator and taking, you know, exploiting this uh, effective bulk modulus of the Helmholtz resonator. And yeah, this plot is also just to show that um, we can further improve this shifting of the mass or mass resonance frequency by increasing the filling ratio of a Helmholtz resonator. So the larger the Helmholtz resonators are inside the double wall, the stronger this effect will be. And we also did an experimental demonstration of this. Um, you can see here on the left side, um, basically our schematical setup. We have these two walls. We have um, the resonator that are like, they are made of foam. So you can see a picture on the lower left and this foam structure made them very lightweight. So the, the Thanos resonators overall had a mass of 900 gram per square meter, which is around 12% of an added mass compared to the double wall without any Helmholtz resonator. So again, very low value. And we compared this to a double wall with the same wall spacing, same wall masses, so the same conditions, but without any Helmholtz resonators. And we deactivated the Helmholtz resonators by closing them with tape, basically, so the orifices. And here's the one of the results that we uh, got in the lab. So the black curve is the double wall without Helmholtz resonators. And the green curve is the double wall with resonators. It's a diffuse incidence, so like a practical, um, typical excitation. And the improvement is, is quite broad. It goes from almost 200 hertz to 600 hertz. And you can also see this is highlighted by these arrows that the mass and mass resonance frequency is slightly reduced by introducing these Helmholtz resonators. And um, this is just by adding 12% of mass, which is quite, quite tremendous. So this was the behavior of Helmholtz resonators. And we, earlier we saw the behavior of play type acoustic meter materials. And almost obviously the next step would be to think about here, yeah, can we just combine these two effects by having a PAM with Helmholtz resonators? So uh, this is, was actually published quite recently this year uh, where we um, had a project, a project for an MSc student actually work on it. It's a really nice project which, which turned into a paper which is always a very nice thing also for the student to have this experience of having something published. And in this case, we have the base plate. And remember in this PM, we had these periodically attached masses. And in the first slides that I showed you, these masses were just discs. But now we change the geometry of these masses to sort of incorporate a Helmholtz resonator. So they have both effects. They have this behavior of the PAM and they have this acoustic resonance of the Helmholtz resonator. And you can see on the right side, a picture of the uh, um, experimental sample. It has hundreds of Helmholtz resonators that were glued to the plate. So uh, the student did a lot of work of you know, manufacturing this. But if we look at the measurement results, we can see the red curve is the plate type acoustic meter material with the Helmholtz resonators closed. So it's just the PAM effect. Basically, you can see one anti-resonance. And if we now open the Helmholtz resonators, we can see that two peaks appear. So one at the Helmholtz resonance frequency, HR, and one at the PAM anti-resonance frequency. Um, but we, yeah, we get two peaks, basically. Um, however, this result um, didn't look too good because you can see in these two, between these two peaks, there's a strong reduction of performance. And the result of the, uh, this was explained by the base plate, which is quite thin and therefore could vibrate quite strongly so that there was like a coupling between the Helmholtz resonance mode and the PAM modes. And this would lead to this reduction of transmission loss in between these two peaks. We did some simulations where we replaced this flexible base plate by a rigid base plate. And then you can see that these two effects, Helmholtz resonator and PAM become decoupled and you have two very nice peak and basically by introducing Helmholtz resonators without changing any mass and other stuff, you get an additional peak more or less for free. Obviously it's not for free because manufacturing Helmholtz resonators is much more difficult than just manufacturing this. But in terms of weight, um, this peak comes for free. So I want to conclude this talk with some very recent research I did at the ISVR um, about active membrane type acoustic meter materials. So, and it, another type of metamaterial, but member type acoustic metamaterials are basically just plate type acoustic metamaterials where the base plate is a pretensioned membrane. 
And the problem I was looking here is, is a very natural thing that comes to mind when you think about these um, metamaterials that have very narrow bandwidth um, compared to other things that we might know. And if you think about this situation where we use a membrane type acoustic metamaterial to block propeller noise, a tonal propeller noise, you can see the spectrum on the left with this peak. And if we have tuned this metamaterial to this specific frequency, and we look at whatever is coming to the listener, you can see in this case, in this easy case, there will be no tone on the receiving side. But you can imagine what happens if the propeller changes the rotational speed, then suddenly the frequency will change. And as the frequency changes, but the metamaterial keeps its properties, the peak will suddenly appear. So suddenly you will hear this tone and you know, using this metamaterial, there's no use of it anymore because it is not tuned to these different frequencies. And you can see this also happens when it uh, moves to higher frequencies. So the idea was to have a metamaterial that is capable of tracking these changes of the source tone frequency and adapting itself so that you don't hear this tone even when the RPM of the propeller, for example, change. So what I looked at is, um, attaching a very small electrodynamic actuator on these masses in each unit cell, and then applying a very simple control strategy. We measure the pressure that is incident on the metamaterial, this is P1, feed it through a gain, K, just a simple gain, and then this amplified signal U will be provided to the exciter. And you can change the value of the gain just by turning a knob or something on your amplifier, and you can see what happens if we have different values of this gain K for a negative gain K of minus three millivolts per Pascal, we shift the anti-resonance frequency to lower frequencies. And if we have a positive gain, this anti-resonance frequency moves to higher frequencies. And we can exploit this to track changing frequencies in our source spectrum. There are different ways of doing this. I will show you just a very, very simple, maybe the most simple realization of this tracking behavior, where we added to this control setup I showed you earlier, a, a algorithm that detects the actual frequency where we have the peak. The peak detection algorithm could be based on the FFT, for example. And then this peak algorithm, the peak detection algorithm is, will output the actual frequency that we want our metamaterial to be tuned at. But we need to know what kind of gain K we have to apply to get our metamaterial tuned to the specific frequency. In this case, we use just a simple lookup table. So this is pre-computed. We know we want, for example, for an under frequency of 400 Hertz, we need a gain of about 15 millivolts per Pascal. So this will then be applied and this metamaterial is, then changes its properties to the specific frequency. And here's just an example of um, what the results could look like. So on the left side, this is a spectrogram now. So we see over time and frequency how the sound level at the receiving side changes and the sound level is color coded. So a yellowish color means high sound level, a darker color means low sound level. And the left plot shows the case where this metamaterial is passive. So it doesn't change its properties over time. And this, you know, this line that you can see there, this is basically the tone that changes frequency over time. So it starts right at the anti-resonance frequency of the metamaterial, this is the dark area. And then it goes to lower frequencies and you can see suddenly it becomes very yellow, this line. So it becomes very, yeah, you can hear it really well and it becomes quite annoying. And after that, the frequency increases again, passes to the anti-resonance frequency zone and then at higher frequencies, 450 Hertz, it's again, it's very, very, very loud compared to the background ones. Now, if we look at the behavior of the adapting, adaptive metamaterial, you can see that this dark region where we have the anti-resonance frequency now follows the line. And if we compare the color of the tone of this line uh, to the background noise um, and other frequencies, you can see it's comparable to the background noise. So the tone basically vanishes in the background noise and you can't really hear it anymore. So the advantages of this kind of algorithm is that it's quite quick in terms of responses to the frequency changes. So I also looked at, you know, like step changes and it adapted almost instantly to step changes frequency, which, you know, step changes, you don't really have them in practice, but it was kind of interesting to see this in academical sense, but it's not really robust with respect to changes in the material properties of the MAM. So for example, if temperature changes the tension of the metamaterial, 
facts and suddenly this um, uh, lookup table is not correct anymore and you will not get the frequency that you actually want. So there are more sophisticated and robust implementations possible. I'm also looked at FX LMS, for example, which is a classical active noise cancelling algorithm working with adaptive filters. But this uh, increases the complexity of the whole setup because you need additional microphones or sensors. And then, yeah, well, it makes this thing a bit more complex. So, so that's why I limited myself here on this simple setup. Okay, so yeah, I've shown you a little bit um, about these different metamaterials that we're looking at at the ISVR. So I've shown you some results on playtable acoustic metamaterials that are thin and lightweight, but still can have exceptional low frequency reduction. And uh, I've shown you some results about Helmholtz resonators that can be used to modify the stiffness of air cavities. And, and one specific example that, sh that I showed you was broadband transmission was improvement using Helmholtz resonators in a double wall. And then I've already shown, shown you some results about active acoustic metamaterials that can use to make these metamaterials smart and respond to changes in you know, source sound fields and stuff like this. So with that, thank you very much. I also would like to thank my old group at Hamburg that I left uh, last year and went to the UK despite Brexit. So I'm sorry, Boris Johnson, <laughs> your plan failed. And yeah, also thanks to my sponsor. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My details are here or in that list that is um, distributed. Thank you very much. Can you go to the slide where you showed the only material and system like like in maybe a fuselage panel? Which one exactly? It was the metal material in the, in the system of like layered. You mean the one on the aircraft? Yeah. Okay. Please, please. It'll take a while. This one. So the results between the blue and the gray is that. Did you, is that partly because you already had a system of materials or did you have a control needs to compare that to a multi-layer system? Oh, so no, the gray curve is just um, basically the MDF plate in the glass wall. Um, so in this case, I don't have a, you know, applied a second case where the PAM is, is replaced by a homogeneous film with the same mass. Yeah, because you, you'll still get some of those dynamic changes just because you're creating a mini double wall or yeah, exactly. system. So it'll be interesting to see what, what that would look like if you removed the raw material and replaced it with a, a mass of the yeah. same mass. Yeah, I mean, in this case, because the metal material is quite lightweight compared to the other world, there will be a mass, a mass resonance frequency at relatively high frequency. But yeah, I agree. The double wall effect would be visible at some frequency. I don't know which, but yeah. It's really, really interesting results. Thank you. It looks like it's could be practically implemented too. Yeah. I mean, the biggest problem right now is manufacturing because you can see here this, this metal material had uh, thousands of masses and I glued them all by myself. And it was a nice few days that I spent in the lab just gluing masses. So you can't do this in practice, obviously. So there are other ways to, we have to think about manufacturing these. I mean, maybe like stamping or molding or something like that yeah. to create thin places and thick places. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you.
Okay. Our last item of business before we close out this year's CAV workshop is to announce the winners of our student poster competition. So um, the moment our students have been waiting for. I uh, would like to thank everyone who came to the expo last night and uh, took the time to uh, vote. Uh, we had 32 evaluation forms, which is awesome. So thanks to our, our 32 evaluators, we really appreciate that. Um, three winners were selected from the, the posters that were presented. The winners will receive $1,000, which can be reimbursed for travel funds for going to a comp conference to present their work. Um, so that's a, it's a great, uh, great prize. And thanks to all the students for their effort. Um, whether you won or not, it was worth the effort because getting in front of our in industrial partners is, is a really important thing for you and an important thing for us. So we appreciate all of the uh, participation. So without further ado, um, in no particular order, the, uh, the first winner is John Case for his poster photoacoustic measurement of optical absorption aerosols. And come on up. Um, he is a PhD student in the acoustics program and his advisor is Dr. Robert Smith of the Applied Research Lab. You gotta stand in front of the camera so people online can see right. you. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, our next win winner is Olivia Park. Uh, her uh, poster was on assessing cognitive effects of transportation noise on office workers with performance tasks and physiological data. And she was also a PhD student in the graduate program for acoustics. Uh, with an advisor of uh, Dr. Michelle Dijon. Congratulations. Thank you can make sure you're in the camera. Wave at everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> and thanks to those online if you if you uh, also helped with the um, evaluations. And our final winner is Prabhakaram Mangaharam. See here? Not here. Okay, so for his uh, poster dynamic thermal uh, acoustoelastic testing in experimental and analytical investigation. He is a PhD student in the engineering science and mechanics program uh, under the advising of Dr. Parisa Shikui. So let's congratulate him. Okay, with that, I want to thank our corporate sponsors, our guests, our international liaisons and our government liaisons um, for attending this year's conference. I think it was a great conference. Um, I also wanna thank Dr. Steve Hambrick for all the work he did putting this together. Um, sorry he couldn't be with, with us uh, this week and I'm sure he's also sorry he couldn't be here, but uh, I'm sure there's a smile on his face seeing everyone sitting in the room and everyone tuning in online. So um, with that, I will stick around for a little while if anyone wants to chat, but that concludes uh, the program for this year. And thank you again for your attendance and your support of our research and our students here at Penn State. Thanks, everybody.